Hey, welcome back to another video. I'm Michael Hoff with Digital Theologian, and I am so glad that you have chosen to join us for Born in the Power of the Spirit, where we are diving into Acts 2, 1 through 13. We're going to be spending the next five weeks going through Acts chapters 2 and 3, going deep, uncovering some of the cultural context, looking at key words and some of the, the important themes that are in this uh, these two chapters, and it is really my heart that you would gain over these next few weeks some tools and tips that will help you in your own study of the Word of God to go deeper, to connect with the Lord, and to understand what you see in the Bible a little bit better. So without further ado... All right, Acts chapter 2. Today's tip of the day is to pay attention to repeated words. This is going to help you, no matter where you're studying in the Bible, to go a little bit deeper. Pay attention. As we go through Acts 2, 1 through 13, you might even pause the video right now and just take a minute, read through Acts 2, 1 through 13, and see what you notice. I'll wait for you. You go right ahead. I'll just, I'll just wait right here. Are you, are you doing it? Just stop, hit pause. So now that you're back, what did you see? Let me know in the comments below what you noticed in Acts 2, 1 through 13 as you're reading through. Just leave a comment. What Was there a word? Was there a phrase? Was there a theme? What did you notice as you stopped and actually just read the passage and looked for repeated words? As we're going through Acts 2, this is Pentecost. Jesus has told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they are clothed with power from on high. And so here we are 50 days after Passover. That's what Pentecost means. It means 50. Uh, now, you'll hear it talked about sometimes as uh, Shavuot, that's uh, the Feast of Weeks, or it might be referred to as First Fruits, the Feast of First Fruits. Depends on what, what source you're reading, where you're reading, what you've stumbled across on the internet as to exactly how you might hear it talked about. But Pentecost, it means 50. It's 50 days after Passover. So Jesus has been crucified. 50 days later, here we are. But over the years, it becomes associated with Exodus 19 and the giving of the law. And it goes to be, be so much more than just a first fruits offering. It becomes this time of renewing the covenant, of remembering what that God has given the law and what that law means. And then now we have to live by it every day, day in, day out, over the course of the year. And so the people are renewing the covenant of God. They're remembering what God has promised. They remember who God is. They remember what God has called them to do. And so it's not uncommon uh, in Jewish circles for people to stay up all night reading the law during this festival. Uh, and so we may have a group that's been gathered together doing that. They may have been seeking to honor the Lord through the remembrance of the covenant. And as they're doing that, it is in that context that we have a passage where Luke intentionally echoes Exodus 19. He intentionally draws on the themes that are present in Exodus 19 to describe what happens to the birth of the church. And this is the moment when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out and the church is going to be born. This is a moment where people go from being fearful followers of Jesus to they know he's the Messiah and they've been told to wait, but they can't, They like he was crucified not that long ago. So they're a little bit insecure. They're a little bit hesitant. It's like they're, they're not really doing a whole lot other than staying uh, out of the limelight, out of the, the spotlight. And they, they've stayed back uh, as the followers of Jesus. They're like, well, we should probably replace Judas, the guy that betrayed Jesus, and how do they make that decision? They cast lots. They don't, no prayer, no asking God, no, none of that. They cast lots. That's what they're doing in the Old Testament and under the Old Covenant, that original covenant. There are really only three groups of people that get filled with the Holy Spirit. You've, if you're not a priest, a prophet, or a king, 
there's a pretty good chance you aren't getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a few exceptions to that, but the vast majority of people are who are filled with the Holy Spirit for any purpose in the Old Testament are either priests, prophets, or kings. But now we're told, and there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared, oh, appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The walls are broken down. There are no special class of religious people that get the Holy Spirit and nobody else does. Now, in this moment, everyone in the house is filled with the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire have rested on all of them, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they are motivated to do something. They don't just stay the same. And man, I think this is so important for us as believers to recognize that as the Holy Spirit comes and moves in our lives, we shouldn't stay the same. We shouldn't just go back to doing life as usual after we encounter the presence and power of the living God. It should shift something in our lives. So as we encounter God, our lives need to be different. And as we encounter the power of the Holy Spirit, then we are empowered to become witnesses. Utterance, that's that's not a word we use every day. It's one of those like words where you hear it and you go, utterance, utter, 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 utter. That kind of reminds people of cows. And so here we have them speaking in other tongues and it is the Holy Spirit. This is from a wind, a sound from heaven that fills the house. And man, these people are now moving forward, speaking as inspired by God. Tongues really shows up in two ways throughout the New Testament. One is right here in Acts 2, where it is very clear that this is connected to them, the disciples, speaking languages that they do not know, or at least, based on the context, others hearing them speak languages that the disciples don't know. As these other people hear them speaking, it is obvious that it is not Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek, any of the languages that these disciples may have known. It, they are speaking languages for folks that live a little bit farther away that don't speak Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. Folks recognize hill people. And doesn't matter where we're from, doesn't ma matter what part of the world, you can go to the ancient Mediterranean, you can go to the highlands of Scotland, you can come to West Virginia, and folks will recognize hill people. And I'm one of them, and I love it, because Jesus liked hill people too. You have these, these hill folk that are speaking in, in proper dialects for folks that are outside. The second way that tongue shows up is in 1 Corinthians as Paul is describing spiritual gifts and he talks about those who speak with the tongues of men and of angels. And he goes into, yes, there is spiritual benefit to speaking in other tongues, but there's more benefit in speaking a word that somebody can understand that builds up the church because ultimately, right, we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and it's all about love. And so if we can get to that point where we are moving in love, we're operating in love, that is the primary function of the spiritual gifts because everything passes away but faith, hope, and love, and love is the greatest of these. So we need to hang on to love no matter what, but let's not lose sight of the fact that here we are after Jesus, after the resurrection, right? And this is after the cross, after the resurrection. This is the birth of the church, and now we have people who are speaking as inspired by God, and they're doing so in ways that they may or may not understand, but those who hear definitely understand. 4,000 years ago, way back in 1998, uh, I was on a mission trip in Panama. It's the first night that we're in the country. Uh, there are three or four of us gathered in a circle. So our leader of that group begins to pray for us. And he's like, hey, have you guys been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because like we, if we're going to minister here in a foreign country, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. And would you guys just like more of God? And I'm like, who doesn't want more of God? 
And so in that moment, we stop and we pray. And, you know, we just invite the Holy Spirit. We say, come Holy Spirit. One of the m most ancient recorded prayers uh, that was used in Christian worship is come Holy Spirit. So I was there and, I, and we, we prayed and they asked the Holy Spirit to fill us, to fill us to overflowing. And as we did, I, I just like felt something kind of like swirling. It's kind of weird to describe the experience, but it felt like uh, it was almost like words were swirling in my stomach and then I just needed to speak. And so I started speaking and it was something that I, I, had, I didn't understand. It wasn't a language that I knew. I felt a connection to the Holy Spirit. I felt a connection to God. And uh, it was while I was on a mission trip and, and we saw people healed during that mission trip. We, we proclaimed the gospel that you must repent to be saved, that Jesus came, he died on the cross so that we could be forgiven and we have to, to confess what we've done wrong so that we can give our lives to him and be saved. And like that was kind of the message we're carrying around. I've told people for years that before that it felt like I, I was a furnace with the pilot light lit. And then that moment was like the gas kicking on for the first time. And now there's enough energy to heat the house. And it transformed my relationship with God, changed my understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, and so and I see some, some analogous connections between what the disciples experience in Acts 2 and what my own personal experience was surrounding this. One of the other things that was fascinating on that trip is that the, the camp where we were staying, uh, we had local Panamanian cooks who were coming in. These dear women who were coming in from the community, they worked there, they'd come, they'd cook us meals, and then they would leave. Uh, well, one night, one of the ladies had been staying afterward and she was doing some dishes and we'd had some times of worship as as a group of missionaries and just started talking to the cook they shared the gospel with her and they they had a conversation with her and she gave her life to jesus and then they came back the next day and wanted to talk to her and and they were excited she was excited but then they tried to talk and they couldn't and she told the interpreter they didn't speak English. I heard Spanish. I was speaking Spanish to them. And yet, they have this moment where they understand each other. She gives her life to Christ, and the translator was able to verify that the next day. So there's this moment. So I think even now, in missions, we should be looking for the Holy Spirit to speak for for those moments when somebody is in the room where we are as believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit, that as we speak, that that would be an opportunity for somebody to recognize the power of the gospel through the Spirit speaking to them. Man, let's just not limit the Holy Spirit because people get in these weird debates and it's like, well, it's only a prayer language. Well, no, it's only these other languages and you're wrong and no, you're wrong and we're both, we're only ones that are right. Ah. Like, can it be both? If both show up in the Bible, why do we fight about it? I'm sure that definitively answered all of your questions based on my anecdotal evidence. Consider maybe that God is still moving today in ways that you hadn't expected. Maybe ways that you haven't anticipated. Maybe ways that you haven't experienced personally. But your personal experience doesn't negate the experience of the rest of the body of Christ. And Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity is the fastest growing form of Christianity around the world today. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? language. We have 15 different nationalities listed here in this passage. There are people from all over the known world, and they have come to Jerusalem, and in that moment, the Holy Spirit is poured out, and people are empowered to speak other languages so that the message of the gospel can be communicated to these people. Well, what do you think the mighty works of God that the followers of Jesus might be telling people about 
shortly after Jesus has raised from the dead. This new covenant is available. So as you go to renew the old covenant, Let's get the new covenant. Let's experience the fullness of the Spirit being poured out. This is about hearing. What are they hearing? What has been communicated? There are sounds that fill houses. There are sounds that draw crowds. There are people that are speaking. Tongues of fire have come on their heads, but people are hearing them in their own native languages. But it all boils down to hearing about the mighty acts of God. And that prompts a few different responses. The first response that we come across is in verse 6. And so we're told that as the multitude comes together, they are bewildered. They're confused. They're perplexed. They don't know what's going on. That as we observe things that we don't understand about what God is doing, about the state of our lives, about the nature of what's going on around us, that we can get to that point where we ask, and I, I may be perplexed, I may be amazed, but what does it mean? What does it mean? There's nothing wrong with asking God, what does this mean? But then we get to this last group, and it says, but others, mocking, said, they're filled with new wine. So this final group doesn't need to ask a question because they have all the answers already. Now, they're just drunk. Let's just dismiss it out of hand. So I think it's, it's really important for us to wrestle with the tension of what we see going on around us. So if you find yourself in a moment with God and, and you feel like the Holy Spirit's moving, but you don't understand exactly what it is, so I think what we can see from these first few verses is that questions are all right. Being amazed and perplexed and bewildered is okay. But when we think that we already know the answers and we immediately move to mocking, I'm not sure we're in the right company when we do that. But I want to encourage you where you're at right now. And if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, if you would say, I can't identify with anything that I've read here in the beginning of Acts chapter 2, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer that I mentioned earlier, that ancient prayer, one of the, the oldest recorded Christian prayers, which is, Come, Holy Spirit. I mean, I pray that where you're at right now, that you would feel the power and the presence of God, that you would feel the goodness of God overwhelming you, that you would feel the love, the warmth, the grace, the power of the Holy Spirit settling on you right now, and that you would feel the, the bubbling up of the gifts of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would release your presence, baptize, anoint, empower those who are watching this video. May they be empowered to be your witnesses wherever they are to the uttermost bounds of the earth. May there be no restrictions, God, as you fill them with your spirit. Lord, may they be empowered as a follower of Jesus Christ to live a holy life, to live as an example of Jesus, as an example of your goodness, of your faithfulness, and of your love. God, for those who have been followers of you for years, Lord, I ask for a fresh filling. And the call is for us to be filled and to keep on being filled. So Lord, I ask that you would fill them to overflowing now in the name of Jesus. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next video. Have no fear, there are other types of videos coming out on the channel. So if you don't wanna miss those, be sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you wanna get notifications of when the videos come out right when they do, hit that notification bell as well. Thank you very much and be sure to leave a comment letting me know what you noticed as you read through Acts 2, 1 through 13.